Up next, we have Jordi Ross Geralt, who is managing editor with Reservoir Labs. All right. Uh, is this working? Yep. Thanks. Yeah, so I'm Jordi Ross. I'm with Reservoir Labs. <clears throat> and I'm going to be talking about gradient graph analytics today. And so the context of my talk is a little bit different in that um, I'm not going to be talking about network security. Uh, the application of this talk is actually uh, traffic engineering in the context of uh, communication networks. And um, gradient graph analytics is a new technology coming out of Reservoir Labs uh, that is designed to tackle uh, um, sort of a critical network operation uh, objective, which is to bring a network utilization from below 30%, which is sort of the way they work today, uh, above 90% utilization. Um, so as you may know, so the traditional way to design networks is based on the over-provisioning over paradigm, whereby if you want to uh, get three units of bandwidth, uh, you need to pay for 10. Um, and that is no longer an option when you're talking about larger scale data centers uh, that need to move massive amounts of data uh, from one location to another. And so you need to really bring this utilization to above 90%. That is sort of the, the target for the technology here, helping in that process. Um, the connecting point with the, uh, with the Zig Week uh, is that we leverage uh, Zig to enable the integration of uh, gradient graph analytics into a, into a network in a way that is seamless um, and uh, scalable, and it provides uh, full visibility of the network. So we're going to talk about that as well. And uh, in the context of this project, we are open sourcing um, uh, uh, Zig Analyzer as well. So uh, let me start with the, with the simple toy example. And suppose that uh, I give you a network, and this network has six TCP connections. And suppose that you know the transmission rate of these six TCP connections, that is 8.3, 16.6, 8.3, 16.6, .6, and 83. And suppose that I ask you, you know, which one is the flow that is, taking, uh, that is having the highest impact on the overall performance of the network. And uh, the traditional sort of conventional wisdom on this question has been that uh, you have to look at the heavy heater flow. Uh, that is also called sort of the, uh, the elephant flow. And if you look at sort of the best practice, what you would do here is basically say, well, um, clearly 75, the uh, flow number five uh, is taking the highest uh, bandwidth. It's taking 75 units of bandwidth. And that's uh, sort of like significant more than, than, than the second flow. And so I'm going to go for that. That's sort of the way we approach this problem today. Now, if I give you a little bit more information on this problem in a, and I tell you the actual topology of the network, um, would you come up with the same, with the same answer? Now, the, read to, the way to read this uh, diagram here is that uh, circles are links and lines are flows. So we have four links uh, and six flows. And now you can start reasoning a little bit more on this problem and say, well, flow five, uh, what, is it? what is it? It's right here. It's the green flow. It's, uh, it's going through a couple of links. And, you know, it's affecting maybe the performance of flow six and flow four, but you can maybe reason that, well, it's not really taking a you know, it's, it's affecting a portion of the network that may not be critical. It seems that this region here might be sort of hotter. And, and, uh, and so maybe you can reason that maybe it's not sort of the biggest flow here. Um, what we have developed at Reservoir Labs is uh, sort of the, mathematicals, the mathematics behind this problem. And we, we have resolved this problem. And based on the topological structure of the network, we can tell you uh, which is the, the flow that has the highest impact. And the, the result of this sort of mathematics is that uh, networks actually have something called bottleneck structures. Uh, and these bottleneck structures uh, reveal uh, that not all bottlenecks are, are equal, that they, there are sort of uh, something that you might refer as sort of ripple effects that, um, uh, and, uh, and that they organize in certain ways in certain hierarchies. And this uh, structure is revealed uh, by the bottleneck structure. Uh, an extension to this structure is, uh, is what we call the flow gradient graph, which is represented in this image. Uh, the way to read this graph is that uh, white uh, vertices in this graph are bottleneck links, and gray vertices in the graph are flows. And so uh, if there is an edge between a bottleneck link and a flow, it means that uh, such, such flow is bottleneck at that link. If there is an edge between a flow and a link, it means that such flow is not bottleneck at that link but that flow goes through that link. So that is the way to understand this graph. Um, and the graph also allows us to actually uh, quantify uh, the impact. So um, the way to read, this is a directed graph. So uh, it tells us also the ripple effects of uh, perturbations that 
you might have on, 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 on uh, regions in the network. So for instance, if you are somehow modifying the performance of link two here, this is gonna trickle down to, uh, to flow four and flow two, but it's not gonna, it's not gonna affect the performance of flow three and flow six. So the, the graph tells you basically the, the ripple down effects. Um, and now we can start uh, looking at the problem again and say, well, what is flow five in, the flow, uh, in this bottleneck structure is actually here and it's uh, a leaf in this uh, graph. And that tells you that re the region of influence of flow five is actually empty. It means that flow five has no influence on the actual performance of any of the other flows. Um, and now if you actually do the math, which I'm gonna, not gonna do that uh, here, but uh, basically, it turns out that the, the flow that has the highest impact is flow six, which you could maybe reason about that because sort of this location seems sort of a strategic here uh, in terms of the, the region of influence. Um, and sort of the paradox is that flow six actually is uh, the flow that, that takes the smallest uh, capacity, 8.3. Uh, so in this example, uh, we have that this sort of completely against conventional wisdom that uh, the smallest flow is actually the one that has the highest impact. So how does this work in reality? Well, here we have a simulation using Mininet. Uh, we're simulating the same network. So again, four links, six flows. Uh, on the upper left side, you have uh, running the, the network. Uh, each flow is trying to transmit 250 megabytes. And you get sort of the transmission rates that, I, that we mentioned um, previously. These are running TCP flows, BBR, congestion control, based on Google. Um, now, if we remove flow five from the network, which is uh, the diagram in the middle, so the flow five is the biggest uh, flow, that's the purple flow, you can see that there is no effect whatsoever on the rest of the flows. Uh, the flow completion time stays intact. The transmission rate is pretty much the same. Um, and, but if you remove flow six, uh, this is the, the diagram here on the right side, you actually see that the, the flow completion time significantly improves. So almost reaching from, from, you know, from 679 being the slowest uh, flow, uh, the flow completion time for this flow uh, gets reduced to 457, so about 40% reduction. Uh, and that is uh, sort of what uh, predicted the, 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 the mathematics of the problem, that indeed, um, sort of uh, the biggest flow actually has no impact, but in fact, the smallest flow is actually the one that actually gives you the, the better performance. So um, anyway, this is a, sort of a way how the mathematics work, and um, the gradient graph analytics actually build on top of this to be able to make um, a smarter decision in terms of traffic engineering. Um, to put more context to the problem, this is, and this is a slide coming from Bill Johnston uh, at ASCAC uh, this year, and uh, Bill here was describing a, a situation in, in, the, in the Large Hadron uh, Collider uh, by which uh, they were trying to, to ship um, this uh, huge amount of data coming from the collider in Geneva all the way to the US, and they were the network was just, was just not working. Somehow they were having a lot of congestion and they couldn't figure out what was going on. And uh, it turned out that there was a bottleneck in the transatlantic connection, uh, but, it, but it was very hard to sort of uh, figure that out. So that's the kind of situ uh, problem that uh, uh, gradient graph analytics can actually tackle based on the bottleneck structure of the network. Um, so that's to put into context. Uh, another way to think about the problem is that, you know, if, if you walk out at night on a clear sky, then Look up, you might be able to see uh, Venus, and maybe you are able to see Mars, but you're not gonna be able to tell much of the detail. Um, now, using technology, you can actually start zooming in, and you can actually uh, tell things like, you know, there is actual, actually there is water one mile uh, below the Mars uh, surface. And so that is the vision behind uh, gradient graph analytics, that it's trying to, um, going into a direction where you gain an intimate knowledge of bottlenecks and flows. Uh, we really want to understand what's happening in the network. Uh, we really want to understand uh, for every flow and for every bottleneck, what are the ripple effects, and be able to use these into a framework that allows you, allows you to actually optimize the network. Um, let me give you another example. This is Google's uh, before network, uh, which is um, an, an SDN1 uh, network that connects uh, globally, uh, Google's uh, large scale data centers. Uh, in this case, uh, it connects 12 data centers. And so you can ask, what is the bottleneck structure of this network? And if you do the math, you get, you get this under the assumption of shortest path and full mesh connectivity. And what is this telling us? Well, um, if, for instance, if you look at the link one, uh, is a leaf in, this, um, in the bottleneck structure. And so it means that the region of influence of link one is basically empty. Uh, where is link one located? Well, it's, it's this link here, and sort of that makes sense, right? Because this link uh, sort of isolated from the network, so it means that really has no impact on the rest of the uh, network. Um, 
now, if we, go, if we go to the root of the bottleneck structure, we, we find link A, and, and it, the graph is telling us that link A has the highest influence because, in fact, there's a path between any link, between link A and any other link uh, in the network, means that link A, ha link A has the potential to affect the performance of any other link in the network. Where is link A located? Well, it's a transatlantic connection, and so sort of that makes sense. This link is highly strategic. And the graph is telling us that any perturbation on this, on this link has ripple effects on the complete uh, network. You could also sort of think, well, there's link 8, but there's also link 10, that both are transatlantic uh, connections. Which one is more relevant? If you look at this graph, you wouldn't be able to, to tell. That's sort of the naked eye view. But the bottleneck structure actually is telling a little bit more information. It's telling you, well, link 10 is here. It has fairly good influence on all these, on all these other links. But somehow it doesn't have the level of influence of link A, which is above it. So that's the kind of insight that, that the mathematics can give you. And so, yeah, there's a theory. There's a theory what we call the theory of bottleneck ordering. But um, we're not going to go there today. Uh, and so actually, uh, there's a paper coming out at Sigmatics that uh, is going to talk about all the mathematics and the algorithms. Uh, but uh, for now, we're going to skip that. And I'm just going to keep it at a high level and talk about some of the features uh, and functions before moving into sort of how this connects with, uh, with the Zeek analyzer. And uh, what the gradient graph analytics uh, can do is basically the framework is uh, an interactive analytical dashboards. Um, uh, you can, some of the things you can do is uh, you can compute bottleneck structures, as I mentioned. It can give you real-time uh, traffic engineering recommendations. Uh, it can do also offline capacity planning suggestions. Um, if you had to invest one dollar on your network, where would you put, in what link would you, that, would you make that investment? What kind of effect would that have? Um, uh, can be used for troubleshooting, network performance, locating routing misconfigurations. Uh, you can also do things like replay back in history, the bottleneck structure of your network, sort of, uh, and to understand based on this historical uh, um, performance, you can understand and make uh, optimize uh, forward-looking traffic engineering decisions. Um, now, to integrate something like gradient analytics, gradient graph analytics into a network, basically you would have some kind of a workflow like this where you have uh, the network, uh, your analytics, and then ultimately your, your traffic engineering tools uh, back to the network. But uh, mainly the, the inputs to uh, gradient graph are three. Uh, you need routing information, you need topology information, and then you need flow information. And this is in, in, the, in the third item that actually, uh, that's where uh, Zeek uh, takes a, an important role. Uh, so uh, we're using Zeek to ba basically uh, get flow information. But the, uh, and one way to look at this is that, um, you know, in, in these uh, networks, uh, typically larger scale networks, uh, you know, one way to do it, you, you could go and deploy Zeek. Uh, and maybe look at con.log. Uh, even though con.log just reports connections at the end uh, once the connection is terminated, so maybe you have to write a small pro, uh, uh, Zika script that just uh, generates uh, an event when you get a scene packet and sort of you report the IP tuple and you get the, the flow information, right? Uh, yeah, you could do that. Uh, and it would be straightforward with Zeek. Um, one of the challenges here, because these networks are um, you know, larger scale, you might have shadow regions, regions where you may not be able to deploy sensors, so that might be tricky. Uh, and also scalability, because really you're looking at all the traffic to be able to, uh, to just extract uh, IP tuples, uh, so you will need to look at all the connections. Another approach, uh, in many of these networks, actually they already have infrastructure to track flows, things like NetFlow and SFlow. Uh, so you might be able to leverage that. Um, one, and then the challenge there would be that you know you need to interact with the collector, and in some cases that might be difficult because you're sort of disrupting uh, the, existing inter, you know, the, the existing infrastructure. Yet a third way uh, to do this would actually be to do both at the same time. So yeah, you can leverage the existing infrastructure, say SFlow or NetFlow, but then you uh, you connect Zeek, but you you actually are installing Zeek to only look at the S-flow traffic. So you avoid the shadow regions problem, and it's non-disruptive in that you're passively um, um, looking at traffic without interfacing with the, with the collector. And it scales well because this, you need, uh, the, the sensor is uh, just looking at S-flow traffic. doesn't really look, uh, need to do uh, looking at all the flows. Uh, and S-flow is taking care of the scalability by doing packet sampling, say. So um, this is the third scenario we're looking at. And so what, uh, to enable uh, the integration, we, we wrote um, an analyzer. Specific, uh, specifically, we wrote uh, an S-flow analyzer. Uh, and that's what I'm going to be switching to that. Uh, we, 
of course, we use Vimpack, uh, which is really, really cool uh, domain specific uh, language. And, and um, for those of you who have already used it, but uh, it's really always, it's really fine, you know, because it really feels like you're writing uh, almost like an IDF RFC. You're just specifying your PDU, uh, the headers, and Beanbag is going to take care of all the magic. It's going to convert that into C++ classes, and you just need to focus on, on the protocol. You don't have to focus on actual code. Um, so the other uh, sort of advantages, advantage for Beanbag is that it'll, it allows you to leverage the, the sort of the 80-20 rule that you do 20% of the work and you get 80% of the value. Really, when you're, when you're uh, trying to write an analyzer, uh, most of the cases, you don't have to write a full analyzer. You're just looking for certain metadata. This was certainly our case. We just needed to get the IP tuples uh, from flows. So uh, in a matter of you know, days, you can have uh, an analyzer running. Even in one day, you can write an analyzer. So a really very productive uh, tool. Um, the SFLOW analyzer uh, has basic functionality. Uh, mainly, uh, it populates the service field in Condon Lock uh, with, an, with, a, with the SFLOW tag. Uh, and then it has two new events, uh, SFLOW event, which issues uh, for each SFLOW, uh, uh, it's being issued for, uh, for each SFLOW uh, datagram. Uh, and that's sort of the control plane of SFLOW, so uh, where you get metadata from the, from the SFLOW control plane. There's another event, SFLOW packet sample, which is issued for each SFLOW sample, and those are actual samples from the network, packet samples from the network, so that's more like the data plane, if you will. Um, the, the analyzer also generates uh, two new logs, uh, the SFLOW.log, uh, which, again, is sort of the control plane. It, rep it records an entry for every SFLOW datagram, and SFLOW sample.log would be the data plane. It reports a record for each um, SFLOW uh, sample. Um, and as I mentioned, we just open sourced it last night. And uh, thanks to Joanna for accepting the pull request. Um, but yeah, so going into the sort of the analyzer, as I mentioned, two, uh, just very basic, a uh, couple of events, SFLOW event on the control plane. It's giving you basically metadata about the, the sort of the SFLOW. Um, uh, the SFLOW agent, uh, the IP address of the agent, the IP address of the, of the collector, uh, the version, the version of the, of the SFLOW protocol that you're running, uh, the number of samples that, that, uh, that, it's, that are being taken, um, and such. The SFLOW packet sample event is more on the data plane, as I mentioned, and that actually gives you the IP tuple of the flow, and that's uh, the information that we plug into the uh, Green Graph Analytics. That's all we care, in fact. It also gives you protocol and the sampling rate, um, et cetera. Because SFLOW is doing sampling, this is sort of highly scalable because you're not really looking at every package, you're looking at the sample of the population. That is enough to capture the flows. <coughs> uh, the analyzer.pack, so again, two generates two, two events, uh, the SFLOW event and the, uh, the SFLOW packet sample. And here, the protocol.pack, here is where sort of the the high level specification language uh, is a place where you have sort of the PDU definition, uh, the, the packet header. So again, really cool that you can just write down your headers, your PDUs, and run the compiler and generate the, generate the, the code. Um, so in terms of the output, uh, as I mentioned, conduct lock uh, gets populated with the SFLOW tag on the service, service column. Um, there's a new flow, sflow.log, which could be seen as the control plane for sflow, which gives you information about the, the agent, the collector, the sflow version, um, the number of sub samples that have been taken. So eight means that you're sampling one packet out of eight in this case. Um, the, and then there's uh, the sflow sample.log, uh, which is the data plane from, for the SFLOW, and this, here's where you have the actual uh, samples, and, and here you have the IP addresses, sort of the IP tuple for the connections that really go into uh, the grid and graph analytics to, to generate the bottleneck structures. Um, okay, just some visualization. Uh, this is sort of the output. Uh, that's uh, the interactive dashboards. Uh, you, get, you get to see, of course, the network, so, and this is uh, Google's before network, the 12 data centers that I mentioned. Uh, you get to see the flows. That's sort of the traditional view of a topological view of with, the, with the connections. But then you, you get to see the bottleneck structures of the network, and this uh, is visualized in real time. You can also play them back in time so for the analysis. Uh, and also the, the flow gradient graph, uh, and this is a view where, where you can see 
uh, we're selecting Flow 22 and we're asking the tool to give us the, the region of influence for Flow 22, Flow 22. And so these are the set of flows in gray and the bottleneck links in white that are affected by the performance of Flow 22. And that's really all I wanted to, to touch. Uh, we have a, a live demo running outside for Gradient Graph, running out of uh, the ESNet uh, test, but with just uh, one caveat that is actually running actually offline because of the, the blackouts in California. So, uh, um, but yeah, feel free to show up. Uh, any questions? How do you know which? Which link? Yeah, right. And that is the routing information. So we, we also take the routing information from the network. Uh, that is a different story. But yeah, we need to take routing uh, and flows. Yeah, so we can use, uh, in some cases, we use like OpenBMP for the routing. Uh, and based on that, we can understand the paths. And then from there, uh, compute the, the bottleneck structures. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks.